Wonderful. Well, I will welcome us here then formally, officially here to our NSA alumni evening with Dr. Schlecht here and his talk, his presentation here on pestilence in the history of the church. And we'll get to that here shortly. Uh, yes, I am recording. Thank you. And it is, it is going here. So uh, we are set there. Thanks for the question there. We are, we are on. Um, so let me, um, I'm, I've got a few introductory uh, comments and um, some information here uh, for you as we get started. And then after about 10, 12 minutes or so, I will hand it over to Dr. Schleck to take it away. So uh, to introduce, um, my name is Jesse Sumter, as it says up there, and I am the president of the NSA Alumni Association Board. And I have been doing that since the beginning of the year here, uh, 2020. And there are a number of alumni, uh, there are five of us who are on the board, including myself, and I'll introduce them real quickly here, um, give you their names and a little bit of information about them. And some of them are here. I think maybe maybe all of them or, or most of them are here. Um, and then I've got a couple of other, other uh, details, information about the association and about the college then to talk about. So uh, first uh, for the board, we have uh, Jen Carlson. She graduated from NSA 2003, uh, 2003 there. She's wife to alumnus Joe Carlson and they live in Santa Cruz, California where Joe preaches and teaches. And then also on the board, we've got Gwen Burrow, graduated 2010 and she is a writer and event manager at IMSI in Moscow, Idaho here. And she is working on her MFA in creative writing at New I think Gwen is also an event. She's also an event. Okay, good. That's right. She's not just an event manager. Gwen Burrow is an event. Wonderful. Okay, there you go. You've heard it. <laughs> We've also got uh, Daniel Fugashan on the board. Uh, he graduated 2010. He lives in Moscow, Idaho with his wife and family. And he is also the CEO at Roman Rhodes Media, which is a classical Christian curriculum publisher. And then also on the board, we have Christiana Hale, uh, 2015 graduate, as well as a uh, master of 2017. And uh, she teaches Latin and English here locally at Logos School. And then she is also working on an MFA at New St. Andrews here. And it says here that she has a nonfiction book that's under contract that should be coming out here in the summer here. So maybe keep an eye out for that, okay? And then for myself, um, I'm a classical teacher uh, with Veritas Scholars Academy, which is an online Christian, classical Christian school. And then I'm also the managing editor for the blogazine at Cross Politic. And then my wife and daughter and I, we live here in Moscow, Idaho. So just a little bit about us and the board here. I wanna talk just briefly about the vision for the alumni, NSA alumni board and um, uh, what we're doing here, what we're trying to do. And so the vision is to recognize that as alumni of NSA, we are part of an exclusive club. And this is a um, quite the honor to be in this club. And so we want to recognize that by doing things like this and um, trying to encourage and promote each other and give each other opportunities to continue to grow and learn. And we also um, want to um, have access to our teachers like Dr. Schlecht, as well as have access to each other um, as being a part of that, that club, a part of that, that group as a NSA alum. And um, with that, then as we're thinking about alumni, we want to recognize that our alumni, um, we are the embodiment or should be the embodiment of the NSA vision. So I was gonna remind you of that here, the vision of NSA is to graduate leaders who shape culture, living faithfully under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's what uh, we are embodying as we have gone out from the college and we are all over uh, the country here, all over the world. And uh, we are uh, working in different areas in um, uh, politics, arts, uh, business, the economy, um, education. And so we wanna try and keep connected 
and see how are we shaping culture, right? And we want to um, recognize that and think about that and try to keep track of each other as we can that way. And uh, so keeping connected, right? That's one of the uh, key ideas, uh, vision for the Alumni Association here is to keep connected then. And key ways to do that, a couple key ways to do that. One is the Facebook uh, private group on Facebook, the alumni group there. It's a private page. And if you are not familiar with that, we encourage you to uh, get connected to that and to uh, get on there and um, you can see what others are doing. I would encourage you that as alumni, you can post on there regularly. The board is posting on there to try and encourage uh, communication that way. But if you would like to share, hey, this is what we're doing in Texas or this is what we're doing in Oregon, or hey, this is some information that we think is helpful or hey, you should consider this, you know, feel free to post in there and uh, to um, uh, share what's going on in your neck of the woods there. And then uh, you can also uh, check out, there's a public Facebook page then you can like and you can follow where we're posting things about the alumni um, interviews and things like that. So you can keep track of that as well. Uh, but the idea there is to try and encourage alumni to connect so that we can um, both offer opportunities to each other as well as um, get connected and, and you know maybe there's a, an opportunity that you have like a uh, maybe a job or uh, some sort of project that you're working on and you, and you think hey this would be great to get another NSA alum connected with this and so um, you can do that right on that uh, private Facebook page um, or you can maybe email the board and say hey I'd like to get connected with another NSA alum is there uh, someone who might be able to you know do this or could you send this out to the to the email list, that sort of thing. And um, that way we can, again, be promoting each other and encouraging each other, um, maybe working on similar projects together, that sort of thing. So uh, getting connected there. Um, and then also, if you have other ideas for the association here, if you're like, hey, it'd be great for us as alumni to do this, or for us to you know, have this guy come and speak to us, or, or maybe um, this person do a presentation for us, maybe online like this or in person, you can send us that information and we'd love to hear that. And um, again, think of other opportunities to bless each other and to help each other grow here. Um, and I will also be putting my email address in here. So if you need to or want to get a hold of me, I'll put this in the chat box if I can do this while I'm talking and so on here. Let me see if I can do this. Uh, boom, there, there's my email address if you need it there in the chat box. Um, okay, and then let's hear the other vision here. So, so getting connected, being connected with each other as alumni, that's important for us being a part of this, this group and encouraging each other there. And then the other part of our vision is to support the college, to encourage the college in, in their vision and to support our alma mater. And uh, the first thing there on that supporting college is um, encouraging uh, students to come to the college. So I would commend to you uh, that um, that you um, communicate to high school students who are looking at college, um, even if they have already uh, heard of the college, or maybe they already are thinking about going, even hearing from uh, alumni, that's a great, that's a great thing for them to hear from. Say, hey, you know, um, you know, this is, um, this is my experience at the college, and I would encourage you to you know, consider the college and this is why I went okay so um, okay oh let's see here did it not go to the uh, attendees okay let me try my email again here just a second while I'm talking okay there it is to attendees okay there's my email thank you there's my email I think it went to everyone now if you need it um, so again encouraging students to come to the college um, if you know of high school students tell them uh, encourage them to come to the college. And then as a part of that, uh, in the midst of the coronavirus, um, uh, social distancing and lockdown and so on, it is hard for the college to be uh, recruiting during this time. And so if you can be on the ground recruiting people for them, that's a great thing. And, and that's a, a wonderful thing. So uh, I would encourage you to be considering that and be active that way and be praying for the college during this time. I know they are doing that still. They're able to because of Zoom and things like that, but be praying for them that they, um, they, their um, uh, attendee, attendance does not go down uh, this next year, okay? Uh, the other thing then in terms of supporting the college is giving financially to the college, okay? Let me encourage you in that, giving financially to the college. And a couple of things on that. And um, while I am talking here, let me try another link if I can do this. I will put this in 
the chat box there. Okay, and I'll try and uh, boom. Okay, there's the link. It should you should be able to click on the link there, and that goes right to, or you can copy and paste it there, and you can do that even while I'm talking here. You, that goes right to the give page that for the reservoir fund for the college. And let me encourage you to give to the college financially. And if you're already doing that, that's wonderful. Fantastic. Go for, you know, good for you. Two thumbs up. Uh, blessings to you. Um, but let me encourage you maybe even to consider giving tonight. Um, and I'll explain uh, that as well here. But um, this is something for everyone. I know we have also some uh, NSA seniors who are going to be graduating this year who are with us as well. And so they should be thinking about this as well that the uh, one of the things the college is able to do with the alumni giving to the college you don't have to give lots you can just give you know five ten bucks that sort of thing um, because the college applies for grants and other um, support that way and those um, fund uh, programs will ask them about percentages of alumni that give to the college and so and they're asking for that information because they're interested to know, do the alumni like and appreciate what they got here at the college? Do the alumni believe in and are thankful for what they've gotten at the college? And so they want to see that actually in numbers. Oh, if the alumni give back to the college, that means they, they bought into the vision. They love the college. They want to see it grow and, and flourish. And so they ask that. So by you giving, you don't have to give lots, but by you giving, it shows that you um, are thankful for the college and that you support the vision here. And so uh, with these uh, grants and other funds that the college is applying for, this enables them to apply for more money. So, and it doesn't have to be a lot because they're only asking for a percent of the alumni that give. And so um, the average, I think around the country, I've understand from colleges and universities, the average percentage of alumni that give to a college, it's like between 10 and 15%. So it'd be wonderful if we had more alumni, a greater percentage of alumni giving to the college so that we can, again, uh, show financially that we think the college is actually above average, right? That we are, uh, we think it's, it's worth it. Um, and so uh, just giving $10, let me plug it this way, just giving $10 tonight, um, that ac actually can open up hundreds of thousands of dollars for the college in terms of uh, the building project, things like that, in terms of accessing grants. So you know, you don't have to give lots. Um, even that little bit can go a long way. And then let me plug it one more way here, which is to say that if you give something tonight, um, just a little bit tonight, um, that, that would be a great way to say thank you to Dr. Select for his time here. So um, he is um, here with us and we appreciate that. And so if you want to say, hey, um, I appreciate what he's doing here for us, um, go ahead and say thank you by giving a little bit of money to the college then, okay? And um, so again, there's the link there. You can go ahead and click there. You can click on the $10. You can click on the, you know, the information there. Even do it uh, monthly. That's great. That's what I do. I give $10 a month. Um, so it's not a lot, but just being able to say that the alumni give, um, that's what we want to see there. So, and spread the word to others, right? So uh, spread the word to others. Yeah, give a t get a t-shirt. Yeah, well, maybe next time. Um, send me an email or something. Um, and, um, but spread the word to other alumni that you know, hey, go give $10 so that the college can say that 20, 30, 40% uh, of the alumni are giving so that the college can access these other funds. All right, so there is information there. Again, if you have other ideas or information for the Alumni Association Board here, again, my email is there in the chat box. You can send me an email if you have other ideas or if you know of other people who you would like to have present like this or to come talk to us. Uh, we'd love to hear that or other ideas about how to connect. Uh, go for it. So yeah, I'm hiding a t-shirt can behind my chair. No, I'm not. <laughs> Actually, it's yeah, the closet behind me, right? No. Okay. So here's the schedule for tonight. So we are just about right to where Dr. Select is going to take over in just a minute here. So he is talking on pestilence in the history of the church um, and looking forward to that. He will talk till about uh, for about 45 minutes here, and then it will open it up for a Q&A. And so you guys can type uh, comments in the chat box, there are questions there, and then I will sort of moderate those and we'll take about 15, 20 minutes for questions. And then at the end, um, we'll wrap up, pray, and then we'll close at about uh, 7 p.m. local time here. 
Okay, so um, as I was going to pass it over to Dr. Schleich, I'm going to introduce him. <laughs> okay, um, so as a, a former student, right, getting to introduce a um, an old professor, um, I thought I would take advantage of it. An old professor. <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, so here you go. Uh, you guys don't really need an introduction, but anyways, I thought I would introduce Dr. Schlecht. Anyway, so uh, Dr. Schlecht has always been brilliant, even at a young age. Shortly after kindergarten, he began teaching at New St. Andrews College. He is now known for his intimidating smile and making students do strange history projects like touring old historical sites in magic school buses and reciting old incantations found in Jeffrey of Monmouth. At this point in his career, he has more Roman coins than any Roman emperor. Uh, recently, according to rumors, the library at Vatican City gave him a special iPhone so that they can reach him directly if they have any questions about church history. So welcome, Dr. Select. I'm going to pass it over to you, and I'll get out of the way. And uh, great to have you here, and uh, thank you for your time. All right. Th thank you, Jesse. And uh, I have to say, Jesse, your senior thesis was one of the most memorable. You actually did serious archival work. You went to the National Archives, as I recall, to do the work on the Continental League. Is that right? Uh, and unfortunately, your powers of historical inquiry didn't translate into your reflections upon my own personal past here. But anyway, <laughs> but it is I've I've seen some of the names scroll up in the chat box and it's just a delight serendipitous for me. It's so fun to see Michelle Zame. I haven't seen you in years and it's so fun to sort of see you virtually. The Carlsons are there. So Han Hansen's there, some more recent folks, but just a delight. Um, well, I want to begin with the familiar words, words that you know that Martin Luther wrote. Uh, and he wrote these words at some point uh, between the years 1527 and 1529. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing, for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Now that second line there, our helper prevails in what context? This is what Luther says. He prevails amid the flood of mortal ills. Amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. A mighty fortress, as you probably know, is based on Psalm 46, but it was written when a plague swept through Wittenberg. I used to think that the lyrics, you know, we sing this at the time of the Reformation, had to do with persecution. You know, he was being beset by Roman church authorities. But I'm now convinced that this hymn is a hymn about ministering in the time of plague. We often talk about Luther's clash with church officials. Starting in 1517, you know this, in October 31st, he posts the 95 Theses and the controversies that launched from that point reached a flashpoint in 1521. Luther writes three important tracts that are going to get him excommunicated, called before the Imperial Diet of Worms. What we forget is that the Reformation began in a season of plague and disease. In fact, an outbreak of bubonic plague formed the context of Luther's break with Rome. In 1520, bubonic plague hit cities all along the Lower Rhine River and by 1521 and it had reached several major cities when Emperor Charles V was planning to summon Luther to appear before his imperial diet he would ordinarily have convened the diet in the city of Nuremberg but the plague at that point had advanced to Nuremberg so the emperor relocated his imperial diet to the city of Worms it's because of the plague that we talk about the diet of Worms rather than the diet of Nuremberg if you remember Luther's story, this was the occasion when Luther stood before that diet and delivered the dramatic response to the question about whether he would retract his writings. The speech that concluded, here I stand, I can do no other. 
And it was immediately following this speech that Luther became an outlaw when his friends forced him into hiding for his own safety. And it was in hiding that he translated the Bible into the vernacular German language. And the length of the journey between Worms and Wittenberg heightened the danger for Luther, a journey that was made lengthy on account of plague. If he had gone to a diet in Nuremberg, it would not have been nearly as far a journey as traveling clear to Worms as it was. Through the 1520s, several waves of plague swept through Germany, including outbreaks of bubonic plague. Wittenberg was hit particularly hard in August of 1527 in a pestilence that continued in, into the winter. We did, historians don't think that that was bubonic plague, but it was certainly a nasty disease that took a lot of lives in Wittenberg. And a lot of people in 1527 from the late fall into the winter fled the city. And many Christians remained behind to minister to the sick, to the afflicted, and that included Martin Luther himself and his wife, Katerina. Uh, she was pregnant. Luther's wife was pregnant at that time. Uh, and by then, Luther had become a prominent church leader, a great leader of the Reformation. And friends urged him to flee for safety so that the church would still have a leader. The Reform movement would still have a leader. But Martin Luther and his wife, Kate, opened their home as a ward to take care of the sick in a time of plague. And one of the things he did during this season was write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Now, I'm going to come back to that later. Um, but I mentioned this at the outset just to remind us that this is not the time today here in the midst of COVID-19 and social distancing and self-isolation. Today is not the first time that the church has dealt with pestilence. Um, now, the experience that you and I are facing is certainly new to us. It's new in my own lifetime. Um, and it has affected New St. Andrews. I can tell you that New St. Andrews this term is very different than how New St. Andrews has ever been in its history. All of our classes are online. Um, Many of you are familiar with the field trip that I take uh, to North Idaho. I take students on that magical mystery tour that I think Jesse was glancingly referring to. And I had to cancel that. Uh, I had to cancel that, brought about some uh, unfortunate changes that, Lord willing, they're temporary. But it's certainly unprecedented in my own personal experience, unprecedented in New St. Unprecedented in New St. Andrew's experience. But... I need to tell you that it is not unprecedented in the life of the people of God across time. And that is what brings me to talk to you about this. I should, I should mention to you, just by way of aside, um, by way of report and introduction, uh, a couple of things. First of all, my uh, water vessel right here is a map of Greece that was provided to me by a New St. Andrews graduate. Nice product placement here, but uh, as I, as again, as I see your names and as I remember so many of you, it's such a privilege to talk to you today. I remember you when you were students and it's so fun to, to be here. I can tell you a little bit about my students today so that you who uh, went before them might be able to sort of savor this moment. Something that happened just week, just this week in my history class, and it's one of the blessings that have come in the wake of COVID-19. As I said, uh, the field trip that I take in North Idaho had to be canceled. We go on a tour bus and that's not conducive to social distancing. And I usually have my year in final exam framed in certain elements of it around that field trip. I have students typically take a photograph of something that they've seen in a museum and then they will show me that photograph in the final exam and I'll ask them, how would Herodotus have recurated this display and told a different message about that object that you've taken a picture of? Well, there went my final exam question because the field trip is canceled. And so I had to retool my final exam. And I came up with a exam prompt realizing as I do that 
we're in a pretty unique moment and the new St. Andrews students who are here right now are in a pretty unique moment in time. And so I crafted a final exam prompt that pretty much goes like this and I'll read to you from the prompt. So this is for students. Imagine you work for the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and your supervisor has determined that the current COVID-19 pandemic is an important part of our nation's history. And so images related to the pandemic experience should be collected for preservation. You have been sent into the field to collect those images. And so the exam prompt orders students to go collect images of the experience under COVID-19 and then present that image to me in the final exam and then present pretend that I am their boss at the Smithsonian and explain to me why the Smithsonian should accession that into their collection. Well, I thought this was a pretty cool exam prompt and, uh, and I decided that I would reach out to the Smithsonian uh, and, and talk to them and I, so I, I sent this email that ex I expected it to go to, into the oblivion, but what had happened back in Washington, D.C. in the Smithsonian National Museum of American History is that my New St. Andrews exam prompt this term wound up on somebody's desk who packed it, passed it on to somebody's desk who passed it on up the chain. And I was reached out to personally by Dr. Benjamin Feline, who is the chief curator of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. He holds one of the most distinguished posts in all museumdom, if I can say it that way. Uh, as the individual in charge of the Office of Curatorial Affairs, he oversees a staff of one, some 140 curators, archivists, conservators, historians, and interpreters. And he wanted to see what New St. Andrews students were collecting. And he is personally going to review the images that they've taken for possible consideration into the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian's personal collection or their, uh, their collection. Um, and so my final exam prompt turned out not to be a role play. It turned out to be the real deal. Um, and Dr. Feline himself actually joined by the wonders of Zoom. He was in my class just on Tuesday talking with my people, uh, talking with my students. And so, uh, we have this hard time of COVID-19 and we wind up with New St. Andrews students collecting their experiences for the M Smithsonian Museum of National History. Um, all of which to say that the Lord does some wonderful and delightful things here. And so that's just a little personal update from my history class um, and the silver lining and the blessing, the resurrection that comes from this death of a pandemic that we're facing. All right, so I wonder, and you know me well enough to know that I'm always going to wonder this, in this era of COVID-19, might there be a pastoral word that pastors and churchmen of the past have given to their people in a time such as this? And of course, the answer to that question is yes. Um, and I want to talk about some writings today, writings from the early church and from the Reformation, as I began with Martin Luther. Um, and I want to talk about, uh, first of all, Luther's plague, and I have more to tell you about that. But uh, also, we'll race back in a little while to the early church to a plague that swept through North Africa in the year 252 AD, and some of the pastoral writings and the pastoral ministry that took place there. So that's what I want to walk through to find out, again, what have God's people in the past, what, how have they reflected upon this kind of situation, how have they instructed, have the pastors instructed and exhorted their people, what was their experience like, and does that offer any instruction for us? I really think that it does. All right. So I want to return then to where I began, to Martin Luther. Um, and I want to talk about two writings from the time of this pestilence that swept through Wittenberg in the year 1527. Um, the two writings are the hymn, A Mighty Fortress, which I've already mentioned and I have more to say about it, but also a fascinating letter that he wrote. Now this letter that Luther wrote from this period was originally a personal reply to a friend of his who had asked a question, 
but in his writing, and Luther did this often, that he revised and expanded the letter for publication, and so it's that published form that survives today. And thankfully it survives in English translation when the original was in German so that I can read it and I can share it with my students and with you. So let's talk about disease in Germany in the 1520s, the time when the Reformation was taking off. This is the time when Luther's writings were gaining traction, gaining momentum and attention and adherence in Germany. During that same time, another genre of writing that was flourishing just as well was religious and pastoral literature that was instructing people about disease. Why? Because disease, bubonic plague, and other pestilences were rampaging through Germany throughout the 1520s. Now, the pastoral and popular literature and pamphlet literature about disease uh, has a long history. Um, prior to this time period, this literature uh, had familiar pastoral themes that it would result to, that um, health and sickness had intimately been connected to the protection of saints, or the absence of health to the lack of the protection of saints. And that became a prominent subject of Luther's polemics, as you know. Luther taught that the ministration of Christ and his sufferings is worth infinitely more than any little blink of an intercession from the saint. And the merits of Christ are certainly uh, more, more valuable than anything that might be meritorious for a saint. When we look at the pamphlets, not Luther's writings, but at the pamphlets that spoke to the plague um, during this time period, and there were at least 13 different pamphlets published in the year 1520 alone, we note a change from these earlier themes. The references to saints have disappeared, and there's much more attention to physical causes or what we would call medical concerns. Luther's teachings against superstitions and against this veneration of saints had an impact on how the community was dealing with and responding to and reflecting upon disease. Um, here I'll uh, borrow from historian Eric Heinrichs who'd studied this and he said this, Professor Heinrich said this, the succession of plagues and upheavals created a moment in which medieval healing traditions became particularly malleable, opening the door to religious reformers and also self-promoting self medical innovators and these reformers began to reimagine the spiritual and the natural medicines of the late Middle Ages. And they did so in the hopes of finding a more powerful source of healing for their plagued era. In other words, the cultural and disease context of the 1520s inspired a broad reform in healing, led first by physicians and their printers and soon joined by Protestant clerics, including Martin Luther. Here's the central point that Heinrichs puts, brings home here. Physicians and reforming clerics found common cause in omitting saints from healing traditions and in promoting natural medicine as a divinely ordained source of aid. So Luther's letters dealing with this uh, tell me something about uh, a mighty fortress is our God. And I think this, it, I found it very instructive to think about that hymn, which is so familiar to me and I trust to you, to read in parallel with Luther, Luther's own tract about dealing with plague and disease. So he writes this letter in 1527, I said, that was turned into a pamphlet. Um, and in that letter, we see Luther's view of plagues and of healing. Now, Luther in the tract is quick to attribute plague and pestilence to devils. That's the source. And of course, the Lord is the healer. And Luther was just as unfriendly to people who trusted in saints as those who put undue trust in medical care of doctors. Of course, God is the healer. God is the healer. And of course, you can consult doctors as do God's means if he so pleases to heal you. But God doesn't use the instrumentality of saints and their merits to heal you. God's a true healer. Doctors are helpful only insofar as God blesses their efforts. And saints are not only unhelpful, they are worse. Reliance upon saints stands in the way of relying upon Christ, who is the only one and true 
healer. What do you, and so Luther writes this, that I'm reading now from Luther's tract. What do all kinds of pestilence or devils mean over against God, who binds and obliges himself to be our attendant and physician? Shame, Luther says, and more shame on you, you out-and-out -out unbeliever, for despising such great comfort and letting yourself become more frightened by some small boil or some uncertain danger instead of being emboldened by such a cure and faith in the faithful promises of God. The promises of God and God's faithfulness to keep his promises are what heals us, Luther says. Now, keep that in mind as I return to A Mighty Fortress. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll just read three stanzas of the hymn here, um, reminding you of the first stanza that I started with. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper, listen to this, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. The flood of mortal ills is not persecution here for Luther. The, the flood of mortal ills prevailing is pestilence. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. It's the devil's work. Pestilence comes from the devil. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. And Luther goes on to talk about the plague. He says, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. That's through our sufferings and through our endurance of this pestilence. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. His rage we can endure. Why can we endure the rage of disease and pandemic? Because Luther knows that death is an enemy that has been overcome. His doom is sure. One little word will fell him. And what little word is that? Is it the intercession of a saint? As Luther's, many of Luther's countrymen might have turned to the intercession of the saints in time of pestilence. No, one little word will, will fell him. And Luther goes on to talk about what he means by that. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. And this then, Luther goes on to say, is how we weather the plague. How do you weather and endure pestilence? You do it this way. You let goods and kindreds go, and this mortal life also. The body they, these devils, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. That's a pestilence hymn, and it's a Reformation hymn. We should sing it at the, at, in the Reformation, but you should remember, I hope that you will remember uh, endurance under COVID-19. So much for a mighty fortress. I want to turn back to the letter that Luther was writing. Um, so Luther greets his recipient, and then he introduces the point that comes through that is the object of his writing here, the letter. He writes this. He says, you wish to know whether it's proper for a Christian to run away from a deadly plague. The presenting question, pastoral question in this letter is, is it okay to run away, to flee when a plague sets in so that you won't contract the disease yourself? And Luther has a sophisticated and nuanced and really three-dimensional answer to that very good question. First of all, Luther talks about different classes of people. And he says this, the answer to the question, whether it's okay to flee, plays out differently depending on who you are and what your obligations are to your neighbor. He begins by addressing pastors. What if you're a clergyman? He's, Luther writes this. Those who are engaged in spiritual ministry, such as preachers and pastors, must likewise remain steadfast before the peril of death. We have a plain command from Christ. A good shepherd always lays down his life for the sheep, but the hireling sees the wolf and flees. Luther says, if you're a pastor, you don't flee. Luther writes, for when people are dying, they most need spiritual ministry, which strengthens and comforts their consciences by word and sacrament, and in faith, they overcome death. But he goes on to say, does this apply to every pastor? Not necessarily. Listen, he says, where enough preachers are available in one locality, 
And when they agree to encourage the other clergy to leave in order not to expose themselves needlessly to danger, Luther says, I do not consider such conduct sinful because spiritual services are provided for. The people are cared for. And so if you have enough pastors to attend to the sick, the other pastors can flee because we have a future, a future ministry that we look forward to. That's what Luther says. Um, and Luther says, such conduct is not sinful. Spiritual services are provided for and because they would have been ready and willing to stay if it had been necessary. Luther says the same thing about magistrates. Turning to magistrates, he says, magistrates can't abandon their posts. If you're a magistrate, you don't flee to escape a pestilence because you need to keep public order. Um, in a vacuum, people can start looting and pillaging and law and order break down and they, they're, the people are beset by other threats now than the disease itself and you need to protect your people from those threats. And so if you're a magistrate, he says, you can't leave. Luther turns his attention to other classes of people. Um, Luther writes this, what applies to these two offices, to the clergyman and to the magistrate, he says, should also apply to persons who stand in a relationship of service or duty toward another. A servant, Luther says, should not leave his master nor a maid her mistress, except with the knowledge and permission of master or mistress. Again, a master should not desert his servant or a lady her maid unless suitable provision for their care has been made somewhere. This is really interesting. Now, you have to go back into the uh, early modern household economy here. If household servants flee, then the masters don't eat. Remember, many of these household servants are the ones that are gathering, gathering, collecting. They're organizing the preparation and distribution of food. These are necessary functions, necessary for other people to survive. And so that's why people with such obligations, Luther says, must not flee because you must, Luther says, serve your neighbor according to the calling of who your neighbor is in, in your given role. So this is really interesting then. I'm, I'm wondering what Luther then would say to today's grocer and pharmacist in our context. You don't flee the plague and then leave the pharmacist not distributing drugs that are necessary for health and livelihood. Um, you don't, the grocer and the supply chain for the grocer doesn't just stop because people still need to get fed. It's interesting the, the conceptual and principial parallels that we see from Luther's treatise to our own day. Luther goes on to say, likewise, mothers and fathers are bound by God's law to serve and help their children and children, their fathers and mothers. So if a plague comes through and you're a parent, you don't flee the plague and leave your children vulnerable. You need to tend to your children, Luther says. But uh, Luther goes on to uh, develop uh, some nuance to this. He says, um, if someone is fearful, they're weak and they're vulnerable, Luther says this, if they're a parishioner, he says, let him flee in God's name as long as he does not neglect his duty toward his neighbor, but has made adequate provision for others to provide nursing care. Luther goes on to say, to flee from death and to save one's life is a natural tendency implanted by God and not forbidden unless it be against God and neighbor. As Paul says in Ephesians, Luther quotes, no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And so Luther comments, it's even commanded that every man should as much as possible preserve body and life and not neglect them. He says, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, Luther, um, that God has so ordered the members of the body that each one cares, uh, cares for and works for the other. Okay. And then he goes on to reason a fortiori. Um, this is a how much more argument. Luther said, says this, it's not forbidden, but rather commanded that by the sweat of our brow, we should seek our daily food, clothing, and all we need and avoid destruction and disaster wherever we can, as long as we do so without detracting from our love and duty toward our neighbor. How much more appropriate is it therefore to seek to pre preserve life and avoid death if we can do so without harming our neighbor, he says. Inasmuch as life is more than food and clothing, and as Christ himself says in Matthew 5, if someone 
um, well, he, he goes on to uh, cite examples from Scripture. He says, Abraham was a great saint, but he feared death and escaped it by pretending to be, that his wife Sarah was his sister. Um, he cites other examples. Jacob fled from his brother Esau to avoid death at his hands. David fled from Saul and from Ab Absalom. Moses fled to the land of Midian when, uh, when the king searched, him, uh, searched for him in Egypt. Luther says, many others have done likewise. All of them fled from death when it was possible. And he says, and they saved their lives. And they did so without depriving their neighbors, and this is the chief caveat, without depriving their neighbors of anything but first meeting their obligations toward them. What of those who would say this? And in Luther's day, there, there were those who thought that you would achieve favor in God's sight by unnecessarily taking suffering upon yourself. And this is where Luther turns into his classic polemic voice. And he offers this reductio ad absurdum to those who think that it is a spiritual duty to put themselves in harm's way because that's going to be good for their sins. Luther says this, By such reasoning, when a house is on fire, no one should run outside or rush to help because such a fire is also a punishment from God. Anyone who falls into deep water dare not save himself by swimming, but must surrender to the water as to divine punishment. Very well. Do so if you can, if you can. But Luther says, but don't tempt, tempt God and allow others to do as much as they're capable of doing. Likewise, Luther says, if someone breaks a leg, is wounded or bitten, he should not seek medical aid, but he should say, it's God's punishment. I shall bear it until it heals by itself. Freezing weather and winter are also God's punishment and can cause death. Why run to go inside near a fire? Be strong and stay outside until it becomes warm again. We should then see no apothecaries. He means pharmacists or drug vendors. We should see no apothecaries or drugs or physicians because all illnesses, illnesses are punished from God. Hunger and thirst are also great punishments and torture. Why do you eat and drink? Instead of letting yourself be punished until hunger and thirst stop themselves. Ultimately, such talk, Luther says, will lead to the point where we abbreviate the Lord's Prayer and no longer pray, deliver us from evil. Luther is saying, basically, if you, are, if you faithfully pray, deliver us from evil, then Luther says, then avoid a disease for Christ's sake. <laughs> All right, so there's Luther's counsel, Luther's reflections on the pestilence that was running through Wittenberg in 1527, in the latter months of 1527. Um, and I told you I want to sort of bracket this on the timeline by giving you a Reformation story, and then I want to turn to another pestilence, this one now from the early church. So we've got a scene change here, and I want to rewind some 1,300 years to another pestilence. <laughs> okay, um, this was a, a rough period for the church in North Africa. This is a pestilence that followed within just a year after a persecution had swept through. The Christians in North Africa were persecuted by the Roman Emperor Decius. Roman Emperor Decius uh, lost his throne actually to assassination. Those pers persecutions eventually blew over. And then immediately on the heels of that, uh, a war broke out because of the political aftermath. And on the heels of that, a plague came through. A pestilence came through. And thankfully, due to different circumstances, two of the great churchmen in North Africa in different cities wrote and addressed their congregations during this time period, and uh, their writings survive. First, the Bishop of Alexandria, Dionysius of Alexandria, and then also the Bishop of Carthage. Um, they both had faced persecution. The persecution had played out similarly in both of those cities, even though Carthage and Alexandria are 1,500 miles apart. Um, and during the persecution, both men had gone into hiding. Dionysius hid in the desert, and Cyprian had also fled. And then uh, when, as I said, the persecutions blew over, there was political unrest. Berber tribes were 
um, were going against the local authorities and that resulted in a lot of the fields being trampled and a famine hit. And then the plague came through, the pestilence hit. Um, and this pestilence hit in about the year 242. And it becomes the occasion for two writings, one from Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, and the other from Dionysius, Bishop of Alexandria. Let's turn first to Cyprian. What does he say? What's his pastoral voice in the time of pestilence? What would a Christian pastor say to his people in a time such as this? It's happened before. Okay. Cyprian writes this. The fear and faith of God ought to make you prepared for everything, he says. Although it should be the loss of your private estate, although the constant and cruel harassment of your limbs by agonizing disorders, although the deadly and mournful wrench from wife, from children, and from departing dear ones, Cyprian says, let not these things be offenses to you, but battles. He says, these things are not offenses, but they are calls to arms. He says, don't let them weaken or break the Christian's faith, but rather let, let them show forth his strength in struggle, since all the injury afflicted by present troubles is to be despised in the assurance of future blessings. God will bless those who suffer affliction faithfully. He's, he goes on to say, Unless the battle has proceeded, there cannot be a victory. How can you enjoy the fruit of victory if you don't go through a battle, Cyprian is saying. He goes on, When there shall have been, even in the onset of battle, the victory, then also the crown is given to the victors. You've got to go through the suffering to get through the crown. He says, The ship's helmsman is recognized when in the calm waters? No, Cyprian says. He's recognized in the tempest. That's who the true helmsman is. And in the warfare, that's where a soldier is proved. He says, it's a wanton display where there is no danger. Struggle in adversity is the trial of the truth. Again, Cyprian of Carthage, struggle in adversity is the trial of the truth. Cyprian sees the plague that was coming through Carthage at the time as an opportunity to see God magnified because it's in our weakness, that's when God shows off. It's an opportunity to show the difference, he says, between Christians and pagans. Um, he says, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, after shipwrecks, after scourgings, after many and grievous tortures of the flesh and body, says that he's not grieved, but he's benefited by his adversity in order that while he is sorely afflicted, he might be more truly proved. So he's quoting from the epistle here. There is given to me, Paul says, a thorn in the flesh and the messenger of Satan to buffer me that I should not be lifted up. For which thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. But Paul goes on to, or Cyprian goes on to comment, When therefore weakness and inefficiency and any destruction sees us, then our strength is made perfect. Paul had said, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so Cyprian comments, It's then when, uh, when faith is made perfect. When it's tried, it shall stand fast and it's crowned. Cyprian goes on to conclude, This is the difference between us and others who don't know God, that in misfortune they complain and murmur, while adversity does not call us away from murder, but to the truth of virtue and faith. It strengthens us by suffering. All right, and then 1,300 miles away, we have a word from the pastor in Alexandria. Uh, this is a fascinating letter, this letter from... Uh, from Dionysius of Alexandria, I would love to say more about the occasion of the letter and how it came to be preserved, but it was preserved by the church historian Eusebius, who is half historian, half scrapbook collector. And this is in the Eusebius scrapbook that he assembles in his ecclesiastical history. Um, the pastoral question that Dionysius of Alexandria is addressing is this. Given that a pestilence is, pestilence is raging through the city, given that people are dying, is this a proper time to have a feast? See, here's the interesting thing. Dionysius' letter is written in advance of the celebration of Easter. And so he's addressing the question in anticipation of an Easter celebration. The Easter of the year 252 is coming ahead. 
And Dionysius is answering the question, can we actually have the feast when we're beset by death all around us from this pestilence? And here's how Dionysius answers. To other men, the presence might not seem to be a suitable time for a festival. He's referring here to the pagans. He says, of course the pagans think that this is no time to celebrate. Why is that? Back to Dionysius. In, nor indeed is this or any other time suitable for the pagans. Neither sorrowful times nor even such as might be thought especially cheerful. Why? He says the pagans actually can never celebrate or they never have a coherent reason to celebrate because everything is suffering to them and there's no hope for them. So, of course, the pagans aren't going to celebrate in this situation. And then he goes on to describe the situation itself. Here's what they were confronting in Alexandria. Now, indeed, everything is tears and everyone is mourning and wailings resound daily through the city because of the multitude of the dead and dying. For as it was written to the firstborn of the Egyptians, so now there is risen a great cry for there is not a house where there is not one dead. Dionysius then points out that the pestilence is worse because it comes on the heels of the bitter persecution. And when he's writing to the Christians anticipating Easter and the celebration of Easter, he reminds them of how they handled the feast back during persecution. And the persecution, mind you, was just three years earlier, three years from before he wrote the letter. And so this is what Dionysius says. He says, first, they drove us out and then went alone and persecuted and put to death by all. Even then, we kept the feast. And in every place of affliction, every place of affliction was to us a place of festival. He says, field, desert, ship, in prison. And think about that. At a time of persecution, you're going to, when you flee the persecution, you're going to go out into the field, and that's where you'll celebrate Easter. Or you'll flee to the desert, the deserts of North Africa, and that's where you'll celebrate Easter. Uh, or, and, or maybe you're going to take off in a ship from Alexandria. That's when you're going to celebrate Easter. Or an inn because you're traveling. Or maybe you are arrested and you're imprisoned. <laughs> these are all places of hiding. And he says, these places of affliction were to us places of festival. Field, desert, ship, in prison. All of these sheltering places, he says, we celebrated Easter during that time and so when we face pestilence it's going to be the same way but he reminds them of something else during the easter celebration he says but the perfected martyrs kept the most joyous festival of all feasting in heaven now this is fascinating i've always thought marvelous i've always marveled at the thought of christian worship and what it meant especially during a time of persecution and in a season of pestilence and difficulty Think about what they had faced in North Africa. Maybe your pastor had been slain in the public arena. Um, maybe the old matronly church lady was run through with a sword when the persecutors came through. But Sunday after Sunday, we gather together with that pastor and with that dear old departed church lady, and they join us as we ascend into the heavenlies together in worship. The basis for associating the place of burial with the place of worship, of course, is that Easter resurrection hope. And throughout church, church history, you know this, that churchyards have always been graveyards. Churchyards are graveyards because of the gathering of God's people. If you understand that, then you can also understand how Christians in different times and different locations are together in worship, ascended into the heavens, and Cyprian then writes to comfort his people in Alexandria during a time of pestilence. He comforts them in order to tell them, we are going to celebrate Easter when there are death and dying in the streets in the same way that we celebrated Easter just three years ago when we were persecuted. And how can we be assured of that? Because death presents no threat to us. And in fact, worshiping and feasting at Easter, the resurrection of the body of Christ, is when we remember that. And it's with Dionysius' word that I want to leave you with here. And it's something that I have always wanted my history students to come away with. And so I'll remind some of you who had been in my class over been in my classes over the years. And that's this. To the question, who are you? Who are your people? The answer is always this. We are who we worship with. 
And this is the inducement to study history. Don't you want to know who it is that you're worshiping with this Sunday? You're worshiping with Cyprian. You're worshiping with Martin Luther. You're worshiping with Dionysius of Alexandria this Sunday. This is what animates me and has always animated me to teach history and to talk about history. And I, don't, I, I can't think of a better time to remember that when a time when God has gifted us with the pestilence and the pestilence to remember how his people have always fortified themselves over the ages. Thank you very much and it's an honor to be here. Great, wonderful. Uh, thank you there, Dr. Yeah. Schlecht. And um, that was fantastic, wonderful. Um, appreciate hearing those, those letters and those writings. Yes, uh, a clap, a virtual clap. Uh, digital clap for for the presentation. Appreciate that. And um, okay, so while you are uh, clapping, while you are um, saying thank you and things like that, we do have time for some questions. So I'll I will moderate and um, uh, again in the chat box you can put you can put questions there and you can. Uh, send them either directly to me or um, to everyone, and that's fine. And then uh, we will uh, go through them as we can, as we have time. We've got about uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. And um, so there are thoughts coming in, and I, I assume, uh, Dr. Schleck, there you can see some of these comments. Uh, we've got one question here. Uh, asking about just the understanding of disease during the Reformation. Um, did folks have much of an understanding of the concept of, you know, of diseases, of germs, of, of some of those things, or maybe from Luther's track there? Yeah, at the, at the time of the Reformation, um, the, uh, we did see a transformation, and uh, Heinrich's the the guy whose book that I was citing in this is going to be my source. That's my point of instruction on this. Um, and uh, what we see in the Reformation is a transition from understanding disease in what the reformers are going to call superstitions. Um, they uh, and uh, superstitions and the way out of it is whether or not the saints were or were not on your side and interceding for you, <laughs> okay? Um, and uh, there, there was a turn toward studying the actual human body and the natural world around you that during the Reformation became increasingly dignified. And so one of the things that you see, interestingly, in one of those tracts that I was referring to, um, the, uh, there was a tract in the early 1520s, and this was remarkable, that actually had an illustration. And it had an illustration of a human body and the points, of, the points where you might bleed a human body. Of course, they practiced the idea of the, they understood about the four humors, you know, the phlegm and the bile and, and so on. And, uh, and so you would if you had a disease, you needed to get these humors back into balance. That's what they were moving to, which was from the standpoint of modern medicine, of course, not fully and completely accurate. Um, okay, but they were starting to look at the human body and take the human body seriously. That tract that's got the diagram of the human body was located, what's interesting is the genre of of plague literature was familiar at the time, and that image occupied a space in the tract that in earlier tracts would have been occupied by the image of a saint. Um, so you, that just demonstrates the transition that was happening during this time. Rather than an image of a saint in the tract, you've got an image of the human body. And it was Luther who understood, and Luther was very careful to say, don't misunderstand that. Don't think that medicine is going to be your new saint. <laughs> it's always coming from the healing power of God, but this is the proper mechanism rather than the proper instrument instrumentality rather than the improper instrumentality. Great, that, that's, that's fantastic, that's wonderful. Um, 
other other questions here um allowing others to uh think of some things there one of the things i thought of as you were talking was um uh, thinking through uh, disease and pestilence like this, it, it highlights the body in history in really fascinating ways, thinking about geography and how like that suddenly, I mean, you talked about how they had to move the council uh, to worms there and how like that, yeah, that sort of thing with, um, it, it, it again, it, in the, this very bodily understanding of history that it, sometimes that you, you think you miss that, you, you're so abstract, you know, you're just thinking about the ideas, you, don't, you forget, oh yeah, you know, Luther had a body and they had to, you know, think through like some of these just really geographical, local issues. Yeah, I've, I've always, uh, since I've been teaching, I've, I've tried to, and I think I try to work on helping students to understand and appreciate that, um, you know, we are a great books college in many respects, and I'm one of the guys on faculty who's always reminding people that that uh, ideas don't always, I mean, ideas change the world, but also the world changes ideas. <laughs> um, the world changes ideas, and it's a two-way street. I do think ideas are important. Ideas have consequences, but it's also true that consequences shape ideas. And it's just as true of that. And so like, I think one of the most absurd things that I could imagine is teaching on the Reformation, for example, where you, the kind of a historical analysis that proceeds this way, you know, Luther thinks the intellectual theological thought, justification by faith alone, therefore Europe changes. Wait a minute, don't you, don't we have other agents here? What about printing presses? What about what about people who were in cities trafficking, moving about, taking? If you're going to get from ideas behind Luther's eyes and between his ears to a changed Europe, to a changed culture, you have got to talk about human bodies. You cannot change culture without talking about human bodies in time and in space. Ideas are always embodied. Yeah, that, that's that's great. That's really wonderful. Yeah, I was. Um, uh, there are some other questions coming in here, but just real quick, I was. I had a chance in uh, 2017 to go to um, to Wittenberg uh, there to see uh, Luther's uh, hometown there, and um, one of the things, thinking geographically, uh, you jealous. know, I, I had my I had my uh, my Doctor Select hat on, you know, uh, <laughs> binoculars. I was thinking, you know, and and one of the things that struck me was. Uh, how small it is, how small it really was, and it still is actually today. Like it's, um, it's um, small or about the same size as Moscow, if not a little bit smaller, right? It's like maybe twenty thousand or less actually, and like the area where Luther spent most of his time was just really tiny. But ge geographically, like he would walk basically from the north, the south end to the north end and back every day in terms of going to the the college to teach and back to the monastery to live and stuff. And it was just like. Uh, it was so small. I was like, "Oh yeah, okay, I, I can see that now here." And you, again, you yeah. see you're there. Well, and that's the and that explains like here in the United States the difference between the older eastern cities. Like you go to Boston, you go to Center City, Philadelphia, you go to New York and Manhattan. Um, you can tell that those cities were laid out before the advent of the automobile, and so those were walking cities. Those were walking cities. But then if you go to the cities that flourished in the second part of the 20th century, so if you go to along what we call the Sun Belt from San Diego, Los Angeles, and you continue through Phoenix, Albuquerque, and into Dallas, Fort Worth, and into Atlanta, it is strip mall city. You cannot survive in those cities without an automobile. Um, those are cities that are laid out where bodies use a mechanism mechanistic way to move rather than bodily ambulation. And so the fabric of the cities themselves reveal that. Yeah, and that, that seems to tie in also with thinking about the spread of virus and, and uh, things like that, pestilence, right? Where uh, bodies, you need bodies to spread a lot of these things. And so if they're more potentially spread out uh, geographically um, uh, versus really condensed, um, around how the body actually walks and that sort of thing versus cars and, and suburban areas. There's right. there's differences there. It's fascinating. 
Um, I mean, we, we still build houses close to each other. I mean, even in suburbs, you know, uh, people are still around each other pretty regularly. But thinking about, you know, social distancing that way too. Right. Um, yeah, but, but think of everything you needed for life had to be within walking distance. What does that do to community? What does that do to lifestyle and your, your sense of, of interacting and dealing with community? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, some other questions coming in here. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there's been calls, various calls, uh, you know, recently uh, discussions by church leaders about um, uh, thinking about repentance in, in connection to the virus um, and questions about do we see that in early church fathers, reformers? Does, does Luther address the issue of repentance? Yeah, we, uh, that's a great question. And one of the fascinating things about that is that that was something that was so well understood that it's it's frequently referred to, but it's not given sort of this dilated attention because people understood repentance uh, so well back then. Um, plague is a judgment. Um, plague is a judgment. In the early church context, the pagans would see plague as a judgment, which is interesting. It's just they would have a misfire about the source of the judgment and the way out of the judgment. Christians understood it as a judgment too. The pagans get that much right, but that's but who is the judge and what is the remedy um, in the face of that judgment and you endure it and the Christians would endure the suffering because death is an enemy and we have, but it's a vanquished enemy, but it is a judgment. Luther spoke to that and one of Luther's concerns, I, I guess it wasn't a live question, is this a judgment? The pastoral question is judgment from who and from what source? and what's faithfulness. So there were superstitious uh, things that comes back to the saints that Luther was talking about. Everyone saw it as a judgment. His testimony was understand the one true God and how you please the one true God. This is a just judgment coming upon us. And he was very clear about that. So don't misunderstand the source of the judgment and don't start giving doing penance to think that that's going to be your way out of the judgment. The merits of Christ are the way out of the judgment, and in Christ we endure the judgment, and we have victory over the judgment. That's Luther's message. All right, great, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, someone was asking about the title of the historian you cited there, uh, Heinrich. Um, what that title oh. Really was, or oh yeah, it's a. Let me see if I can. Uh, I can produce that. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty, uh, I, it's a pretty interesting book. Um, Heinrich uh, or Eric Heinrichs, H-E-I-N-R-I-C-H-S, and the title is "Plague Print in the Reformation." Um, Plague Print in the Reformation by Eric Heinrichs. Great, thank you. Okay, another um, another one here. It seems that rejecting saints' intercession while allowing medical science is part of or contributed to the body-soul alienation in the West, perhaps, uh, some sort of body-soul issue there. Um, uh, um, it's, it doesn't seem without its own problems, though. Is that fair, I guess, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that that was a presenting issue. Luther, Luther favored medicine, but again, his caution, he understood, he favored medicine in the same way he favored preaching. The Lord uses means. Um, but it's the Lord who quickens the, quickens the dead soul. And, uh, and so that's how he, he would have articulated it. And so you've got a body, you can use a physician, but it's the Lord who's quickening the body too. Um, and the Lord doesn't use the means of saints intercession and all the penance. Um, in terms of mind, body, dualisms um i would uh i would i would say at least to my way of thinking and this is i haven't honestly given this too much thought um as it pertains to the reformation in this question as they were presenting here but i think we're downstream from some some bigger issues that arose as the doctrine of penance had emerged which luther, luther is attacking um the very idea of purgatory became 
uh, it, it's like a place of suffering. And if the soul goes to a place, then a soul has a body, which becomes really conceptually interesting. And the whole idea of purgatory is kind of bound up with actually this embodied. So you, so you got the fleshly body, and then you've got the soul body um, in the notion of purgatory. That, And I think the early Luther, and the very early Luther, you see it in the 95 Theses, he actually believes that there's a purgatory. He's, you know, he's a work in progress. Um, and I think that he's going to start questioning a lot of this sort of thing. And we're going to see it come to roost when he talks about, say, the priesthood of all believers and the dignity of these human, earthy callings. Okay, another question then here. So you mentioned there's the um, the, the saint, uh, prayers to the saints there for the medievals and so on. Is there a something like that for the postmodern world here? Something we should watch for, um, or uh, you know, in, invoking uh, Michael Jackson or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I. Um, well, uh, I do think that um, the postmodern, the postmodern move, and, and this isn't necessarily peculiar to COVID nineteen. It's just like okay, we live in postmodern times, and so no matter what befalls us, you're gonna see postmodernism leaking out in the way that it deals with whatever, um, COVID-19 or whatever else it may be. And I would say that sort of the false God there is, is not to look outwardly, but to turn into sort of self, self-help, self-heal, and self-definition of what, a, even defining what is a problem and what is a solution that's yours to settle for yourself and that's the path to healing um and so we see actually the absurdity that that sort of mindset gives us today where it actually can yield violence to the body <laughs> again where people are not in touch with the reality of their own bodies today because they're defining their own reality um and so we get the transgenderism and that sort of thing um, but we'll see, I would imagine, reflections upon disease that way. Give it the meaning that you assign to it, and that's your way through. Yeah, okay, yeah, fascinating. Okay, another one here. Um, uh, so Luther talking about the plague as having, you know, coming from uh, demons or demonic power. Um, has that idea, was that prevalent in history, uh, early history, church history in particular, or is that something unique to Luther by chance? Um, it was, uh, I think we, I haven't s studied that thoroughly in the, in the patristics. I haven't actually studied that question thoroughly anywhere, but less so in the patristics than in Luther. But Luther throughout his life definitely personified the devil. You know, it's not this sort of abstract force, but it's personal force. Um, and so this is this is certainly pre-scientific revolution, um, and this is something that the pre-modern world I think uh, has a corrective to give to us here, which is the world is a personal place, and so when he sees devil, I think it's actually a healthy corrective to ask when you in the face of disease like who is that rather than what is that. Um, to help us understand the spiritual and personal realities that are always embedded with disease or any kind of affliction. This is how the New Testament talks. Um, so. Great. Um, okay, a couple more questions here, maybe like two more or so. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them here. Uh, there was a question about Hans Luther, who's Martin's son. Uh, said that Hans Luther was a physician. Do you know anything about him or what he studied and researched by chance or came across anything that way? Yeah, that uh, that runs ahead of, out ahead of my own personal bibliography. Good question. Find out about it. Let me know. Yeah, I, did, I didn't know uh, about his about his son Hans. That's, that's fascinating. Um, that'd be intriguing. Um, okay, and then somebody else is asking about uh, kind of piggybacking off of the idea of the devil working in the plague, did, was there much of a, uh, was that worked out there in the reformers view of the plague about, um, I guess maybe some of this you covered already in the, the last question, but any kind of systematic idea there about how the, 
yeah, I guess I, uh, I know that, that Luther is certainly breaking from certain ideas there were about like a hierarchy of angels and a, and a whole org chart of, of devils and that sort of thing that you see in, in some thinkers in the late Middle Ages. I'm not, uh, and I also tend to think that those were the thoughts of the, of the tidy-minded intellectuals. Um, rather than those who, in their ordinary lived experience, and Luther was such a such an ordinary man's man. <laughs> um, I mean, he was a he was a brilliant intellect, but he was a guy in the pub, as you well know, um, and uh, and he had this uh, he had this sense that the the truth that matters is not the com contemplative truth, but the truth that moves and affects people pastorally. And so moving into the, the esoterics of that sort of thing, I think the, to the degree that I understand Luther, and I'm not a Luther scholar, but that wouldn't have captured his interest. He, he was theologically sophisticated, um, but his the ideas that he formulated always had action points tied to them. Yeah, kind of a follow-up question there. Somebody else was asking about were there particular demons that were associated with certain diseases or pestilences? I, you know, I, I want to also think about like um, yeah, there were in the Old Testament. There's some examples of yeah. uh, demons being over certain nations and that sort of thing. Yeah. And you know, would there have been something like that maybe? Yeah, the, the answer is. Uh, the answer is that I think that there was a lot of variety. Um, you know, Luther, some of you know his, his story talked about uh, crying out to St. Anne. Um, and St. Anne was the saint of, of miners and his father was a guy who was in the mines. And so that was the, that was the saint on offer. But then we have the f natural phenomenon of the storm that Luther prays. I mean, he's distressed in the face of a storm and he prays to St. Anne for deliverance from a storm. So his attachment to the saint is a, an attachment to him rather than necessarily an attachment to the, to the scary event. Um, you know, so that, that's sort of like the pre-converted Luther idea. But I also think that if you, if you look at other people, here's a here's a book recommend that I think informs on this. The a book by a guy named Carlo Ginsberg who wrote a book called The Cheese and the Worms, um, and uh, and what this book reveals is that folk folk theology had a life of its own, and we only get little snippets of it in the published material that survives. Um, and I think you're asking a question about folk theology, and if you're looking for it to be systematic, you're probably bringing modern, tidy-minded intellectualization and retroactively trying to impose an order on it to different people who are just going about their lives and probably didn't themselves think systematically about it. Okay, great. We're going to have to stop uh, there then. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Schlecht uh, here and for the time uh, with us. Um, let me again put a plug in here for you all, if I can get to it here, that if you really want to say thank you, you can um, go to that Reservoir Fund and um, go boost the alumni giving there for the college. And um, again, we appreciate um, this time here and um, and uh, the uh, your your work and research here. So thank you very much. Um, and again, be be praying for the college. I encourage everyone to do that. Be praying for the college for uh, recruiting uh, and uh, bringing more students next year. So uh, thank you. More events for remote alumni, please. Yes, that'd be awesome. Good. All right, thank you all. As I see those names coming through, those are fun questions. Most of them I don't know the answers to, but the people who are asking them are people that I love. Um, it's great to see you guys. That's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Schleck, could you uh, close us in prayer here while we uh, head out then and, and uh, go off our separate ways? 
Yes. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good and faithful, and you're good and faithful to us in times of celebration, and you're good and faithful to us in times of trial and adversity, and you even turned those occasions of joy into occasions of festival and feasting. And that's on account of your your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who cheated death, defeated victory, and has rised and has risen and is seated at your right hand. We thank you very much for the unity that we share with one another, even in our different places and locations, knowing that all of these different places and locations, as we've separated as we are physically, geographically, we are one in Christ and we are one in worship as we gather together. We thank you that we can meet one another this coming Lord's Day. And we do that on account of your risen son, whose body we are, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you there. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for coming. Um, there are the uh, recording will be available for others if you want to share it. And um, again, stay in touch, uh, send a message to the alumni uh, board here um, as you like to or as you're able to, and uh, good to see you all. So thank you. Thank you all.